Hello, everyone, and welcome to the January 2021 AES Toronto event on microphone techniques. My name is Anthony. I'm the chair of the Audio Engineering Society Toronto section, and I work for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation as a senior systems designer. Every system has microphones. We've got wired microphones. We've got wireless microphones. We've got uh, microphones on instruments. We've got microphones on people. We've got microphones on cell phones. We've got microphones on computers. Uh, there are microphones absolutely everywhere. And everybody is trying to go for that most amazing sound. Or maybe they're not. Maybe they're just after a normal conversation sound. Uh, this is the thing about microphones and microphone techniques is everybody acts and reacts different to different things. And today's tonight's performer, uh, performers, presenters are going to talk about various techniques, uh, various products, various uh, ways that they have achieved certain tones and certain characteristics of certain things. Uh, we've got some great presenters lined up tonight who are uh, both uh, guests of the Toronto Audio Engineering Society and friends of the Toronto Audio Engineering Society. The Toronto Audio Engineering Society, uh, we are audio engineers who want to know more. So we preserve presentations and what we're doing tonight in this presentation uh, as well, well, we're just trying to get people involved. So participation for posterity. So these techniques, uh, this video will be on YouTube and, 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 and published uh, until we can no longer publish it, I guess. Uh, of course, we need sponsorship to do this and, and we rely on uh, Canada's trusted brands of uh, audio manufacturing and distribution chains, uh, Solotech, Gear Audio, Sonotechnique, Bell Media, YSL Pro, Electrosonics Canada, BRTB, Global USS, Adamson, Lawo, and avshop.ca. For more information about the Toronto Audio Engineering Society, uh, Earl McCluskey has been uh, maintaining a beautiful bulletin and presentation for well over a decade, two decades potentially. And he continues to post uh, meetings, events, uh, and then collections of uh, Toronto audio engineers through a series of Masters of Audio and, of course, our member showcase. So the Toronto Audio Engineering Society, we unite audio engineers socially. So unfortunately, with COVID and all things COVID related, uh, well, we are we are where we are now. Uh, we are presenting these videos as a, a curation of collections of videos, uh, you know, within our allied arts to collate them and, and collect them and, and share them uh, in terms of scientific knowledge and industry knowledge. Some of these things are very industry knowledge in, in an effort to forward the fields of, uh, you know, audio engineering. So we, the AES aims to empower people, um, at any age, participation. Uh, we want to keep it clean, safe, healthy, open community presentation. Uh, we are all professionals, male, female, binary, non-binary, gender is, you know, it doesn't matter. Here we are all professionals to learn through the craft of engineering, through events like this, uh, presentations, networking, and membership. So thank you for being a part of this, and, and please feel free to contribute and, and join us at Toronto AES. Org. Give the gift of a membership. You know, Toronto Audio Engineering Society is a chapter of the AES mother, we call it. <laughs> it is the New York AES uh, official headquarters. They are the ones who maintain the memberships as well as uh, maintains the structure of uh, what is AES standards and here, we're going to talk about them tonight. Uh, let's see if it goes back. Oh, does my camera work? Yes, it does. So the Audio Engineering Society uh, practices a lot of standards. And one of the things that the Standards Committee, uh, let's just Google this standards, AES. So there are ways for people to interconnect things. There are multiple AES standards, and some of the standards that are available dictate really how um, these devices interconnect. So, as a member of the Audio Engineering Society, you have the available to the availability to 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 access any of these documents for free. So let's let's do a quick search. Let's do Mike. 
micro phone. Okay, so look, uh, Microsoft phone, oh, micro. Okay, all right. So, AES standard for acoustics, digital in interface for microphones. So, AES forty two describes uh, an extension of the existing audio interface, AES3, for microphones. Okay, so this is using data to control your microphones. That's an AES standard. Uh, what do we have here? We have AES48. So the shielding, oh, the shielding of audio equipment and cables can be critical to uh, electromagnetic compliance like for EMC I can't remember what EMC stands for conformance uh, you know it's it's rejection so here is here's a standard I should know well because I chair the SC 0505 standards on grounding and EMC practices so you got to remember this I want to tell a very quick hopefully yeah I'm at five minutes here so I want to tell something Nobody talked about it in this presentation, so I get the luxury of, you know, seeing all the presentations first and saying something last. But it's uh, something that not too many people think about when it comes to microphones is this is an antenna. And and when you open these things up, I don't know if I can open this one. Can I open this one? I got, I got another one that's open here. I got the same microphone that's open. It's like I'm doing a cooking show. So so here you have this this coil. And this coil is just a piece of wire. Like it's, it's, it's literally just a piece of wire that you're pushing and pulling, or it's getting pushed and it's, it's pulling. But it's also an antenna. So I just want to really reiterate that there is a very important reason why there are three pins on here. And it's not just to return the phantom power, but that's another story. I'll talk about that. But there is a component of shielding relative to a microphone so when i talk when i talk into this microphone really really quiet but i've moved closer the energy of me moving closer to the microphone actually you know is is, is relative to, to to my voice and 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 when i move closer i'm i'm, I'm pushing less air and less energy into that moving coil so that moving coil has to become a you know, an amplified signal. So you have to take that amplified signal and boost it and boost it and boost it. And when you do, it is very susceptible to noise. And this is where an AES standard comes in that describes why microphones behave that way and in order so your XLRs and your microphones behave that certain way. That's AES-48 and shields and audio connection because every microphone is an antenna. Never forget that. Every microphone is an antenna. Uh, what else is going on here? So this is AES-54. Ooh, splitters. Shields as related to microphone splitters. Great read if you're into super high-end schematics. Grounding practices. Microphone level outputs of active equipment other than microphones. Okay, so... Again, microphones, special case. If it wasn't a special case of shielding and microphones being antennas, there wouldn't be a standard on interconnect shields and balanced microphone output other than microphones. So just, you know, a lot of smart folks got together and wrote these documents. So XLR standard for audio connector, modified XLR three connector for digital audio. Uh, this is hmm, not too many people use this. So let's, you know, again, to the point of standards, it's there, but not too many people use it connector for surround sound microphones so this will describe for example a pin configuration to uh, uh you know that that type of microphone uh again microphone there's tons of information about microphones in these standards uh, and just by reading the standards you learn how um you know groups uh conform uh, to to those standards. I think it's AES 11. I should know this. So, no, no, uh, it's not. It's AES 14? Yeah, okay. So this is also a vital component to the Audio Engineering Society. And and, and it is really that, that there is a standard for professional audio equipment, you know, for the applications of, of, of the XLR polarity and gender and and really you know there 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 is that is that one piece of paper has made all of these audio connections possible 
So I participate in those groups. I enjoy those groups. Like there are some serious heavy duty uh, swingers who uh, know physics uh, to 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 an extent that is uh, worth preserving, writing down, capturing their ideas and, and presenting it. So all of these documents and all of these AES standards are because of conversations people have had with one another in order to get those ideas out of people's heads in order to make these microphones work properly. So uh, enjoy tonight's presentation. There's a variety of presenters. Uh, in the middle uh, is, a, is a rather lengthy conversation with my, my, my good friend Daniel Cubbert. And uh, please in, enjoy the rest of the show and and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see at the end. How to record a kick drum. One, two, check. One, two, check. One, two, one, two. The kick drum. Played on the one, it makes your butt move. But what mic do you pick? Here are a few classics. The Shure Beta 52. The Audix D6. The Electro Voice RE20. The AKG D112. Let's look at the classic two microphone setup. For this, my favorites are the D6 and the Beta 52. D6 inside, the 52 outside. The inside microphone is to get the attack. Aim it where the beater hits the skin. The outside microphone provides the bottom. Place it at the opening of the hole. Now, mix the two mics to taste. When more attack is needed, use the inside mic. If you want less attack and more bottom, use the outside mic. And that's how you record a kick drum. If you like this video or have a suggestion for the next one, let me know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe. This is how I record an acoustic guitar. If you have any ideas for future episodes, let me know in the comments. Let's get to it. I like a simple one microphone pickup for an acoustic guitar. No need to overcomplicate things. I will use almost any cardioid pencil condenser microphone, but I have to say that my secret weapon is the AKG C460B. The sweet spot on most acoustic guitars is the 12th fret. Place the microphone four to six inches away from the instrument with a slight angle towards the sound hole. If the microphone gets too close to the sound hole, the guitar will start to sound boomy. And if you move the microphone too far away from the instrument, the sound will get thin. But of course, you should experiment and find the position that works best for the guitar you are recording. To recap, for good results, keep it simple. A single cardioid pattern pencil microphone placed near the 12th fret will get good results almost every time. If you like this video or have a suggestion, be sure to leave a comment and don't forget to subscribe to see more. So this is one of my favorite microphones. It's a Sony C48. If you have any ideas for future episodes, let me know in the comments. Sony is known for things like the Walkman, the Discman televisions, stereos, but not a lot of people know that they were heavily involved in the pro audio industry. Came out in about 1979 or 80 and probably discontinued in the early 90s is my guess. It's kind of a rare mic to find, but the good news is not a lot of people know about them. On eBay nowadays, I'd say between $800 and $1,200 when they come up. Compare that to the U87, which is a very sort of similar mic. They're probably used or about $3,000. So they really haven't held their value, and I think it's because people don't really know how great they are. It's a dual diaphragm condenser microphone designed probably as a replacement or a companion maybe to the Neumann U87. Yeah, and it has some pretty cool features. All the controls for the microphone are hidden in this little door and you press these two little buttons on the side and the door pops open. In there, you've got your controls for the microphone. So um, changing the polar patterns, you can go from omnidirectional to um, cardioid to bi-directional. There's a little switch in there that you can switch each pattern. There's also a high pass filter, which is indicated with the music and voice, M or V. So music is flat response and voice is using a high pass filter. There's also a pad in there, a 10 dB attenuation. There's a compartment for a nine volt battery. So if you don't have access to phantom power, you can power it with a nine volt battery. Another cool feature is just the yoke where you screw the microphone in. So you can do these 90 degree turns. So you can do all different kinds of placements. And also even where you plug in the XLR, 
it moves as well. So it gives you lots of options when you have to get into strange places with the microphone. Yeah, so it was like really well thought out design. My favorite applications for the C48 are piano. It's also really useful as a vocal mic. I've used it in omnidirectional with gang vocals where all the singers are around the microphone. Or if there's a group of singers and each has an individual mic, I'll use this on each singer. The characteristic of the mic is really sort of silky smooth. Not a lot of brittle high frequencies. So if you're used to a U87, it doesn't sound like a U87, although I think that that's what they were trying to replace. It doesn't really have that high end sound that the Neumann U87 does, but it has a really warm, pleasant sound. If you want to see the Sony C48 in action, check out the video I did on how to record a grand piano. If you like this video or have a suggestion for the next one, let me know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for attending the Toronto Audio Engineering Society's presentation. Join us at torontoaes.org. Our sponsors are Solotech, Gear Audio, Sonotechnique, Bell Media, YSL Pro, Electrosonics Canada, BRTB, Global USS, Adamson, Lawo, and avshop.ca. Hello everyone at AES. My name is Guillermo Subauste and I'm an audio engineer from Toronto, Ontario. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about recording and microphones and best uses for podcasting or just streaming in general. Um, about two years ago or three years ago I started um, wanting to do something from the studio similar to the NPR Tiny Desk series. So. You know, I was noticing that there were some live streams happening already, but most of them had very bad quality. And I was trying to figure out a way of making it so that what I was hearing in the control room when I'm tracking a band is what's going out to the stream. Um, so in doing some research, I found software such as Loopback, for example, for Mac, that allows you to grab the audio from your DAW and connect that as a virtual mic source for, um, for whatever system you're using, uh, Skype or Zoom or whichever it is. Um, and then in Windows, you can use things such as Voice Meter or VB Audio is another one. Um, and they do the same thing. It's a, it's a way to connect an application and create a virtual sound card and then send it somewhere else. So if you're doing a live stream, uh, which is only, let's say, vocals and acoustic guitar, then um, for sure the easiest way is to just stream directly from the phone. Um, phones in general have okay microphones. You'll find that a lot of them are super compressed, uh, which could be good because, you know, it'll make the signal a bit more robust. Obviously, you don't have a lot of control over those. So as soon as you start introducing other aspects, such as um, an electric guitar, for example, or tracks or, or any any other sort of uh, source, you'll find that um, it'll get trickier the more you do it. Uh, a good advice I've, I've come up with that um, for that, sorry, is to actually use um, use the air as your mixing space basically or you're mixing faders so for example um, if you have a guitar amp it's most of the time going to be louder than the vocal unless you bring the volume down and then in that case you can bring the amp closer to the microphone so doing little sound checks is going to help a lot for that so uh, re doing recordings on your phone and experimenting with different positioning sometimes you might find that you're in a room that's very roomy uh, that it has a lot of reverb for example um, things like couches or you know bookshelves and plants are going to change the sound of the room itself um, so it's just a matter of getting creative with that uh, if you have a computer and you're working with it the internal microphones on most computers are actually worse than the ones on the phones so it's better to use a microphone and connect that to the computer through an interface um, if you're doing podcasting for example there's a lot of options for microphones such as the yeti uh, or blue mic that allow you to connect it to the computer through usb this is a microphone that is both a microphone and also an interface so it does the conversion from analog to digital and digital to analog that's why you'll find that most of these microphones have a headphone output uh, because it's doing the conversion from what you've recorded to what's coming back to you obviously one of the main um, factors with these microphones are positioning so you want to get it in a place that's 
in the shot if you like the look of it or out of the shot but then you can't put it that far and you have to be careful with things like uh, for, for example like putting it on top of the uh, of the desk that you're doing the stream from because if you hit that desk or if with your feet you hit the uh, the tripod or the stand that you're using for this microphone um, you you'll get a lot of rumble the the all these sounds will be amplified and they'll actually be louder than your vocals even um, and they can be really distracting for those that are listening so um, it's better sometimes to even go with a cardioid microphone or a, a microphone that has a bit more of a of a of a you know tighter polar pattern, meaning that it won't be capturing that much of what's happening on the sides or on the back of it, um, which actually allows you to block a lot of that noise. And uh, you'll have to get a bit closer to the microphone, but um, you'll find that they'll work a bit better for just vocals, for example. Um, however, if you're doing something uh, where you're going to be introducing more microphones, then you'll need an interface that has multiple inputs for microphone sources, or even a DI, for example, if you want to connect your acoustic directly into it. Uh, this allows you to have all those different uh, inputs and then uh, connect them into the computer and then create a different balance in the computer, maybe add some compression, add some reverb, add some EQ. Um, the EQ will be incredibly uh, helpful because you can, for example, do a high pass filter and filter everything out that's lower than 60 or 80 or 100 hertz, depending on what the source you're feeding it is. Um, and you'll get rid of some of that rumble, maybe the furnace noise and different artifacts that you're going to get through the recording. Um, also, I find that adding a bit of compression or even a limiter on the master fader uh, will help give a bit more of a polished sound to the stream. Um, I notice that a lot of the times uh, lower volumes that are going to the stream are getting compressed or they're getting uh, encoded a bit differently. So you'll notice when you listen to your streams that things like, like reverb decays or reverb tails actually don't sound as nice as when you had them on your system. So. The advantage of using virtual sound cards, such as Loopback, for example, is that in a way you're forcing the program that you're using, let's say Zoom or an RTMP destination, such as what YouTube or Facebook or Vimeo or Twitch use, is that you're making it so that it's, you're forcing it to be in stereo. Obviously, check the settings of each of your softwares. You'll find an option uh, on most of them for a high fidelity or stereo source. Um, mode that will allow you to to have the actual stereo image that you had and also uh, stop things such as echo cancellation as well um, or or any noise suppression that the software itself would have all these devices or all these different um, add-ons that you have are great for when you're doing only vocals but um, as soon as you start adding any instruments, you'll notice that, that they actually do affect quite a bit. In my case, for example, right now I'm using an L22, which is a microphone by the company uh, Townsend Labs. Um, and I have it going through my interface, which is a universal audio interface. So this microphone right now is simulating a U47. Um, these microphones are great. You know, I, I recommend them if you have $2,000 uh, to spend on a microphone. Other options could be um, uh, Aston is a great brand as well. I have uh, a bunch of their microphones and I find the Spirit to be a great option. Um, it's a microphone that's not very hyped on high frequencies, which is one of the problems that you'll find on most uh, large diaphragm condensers that are in the lower side of the of the spectrum of price. Um, for example, the Neumann, the TLM series, the 102 and 103s, a lot of people like them. I find them a bit too harsh. Um, you'll find that all the sibilant frequencies will be accentuated quite a bit. Um, the Aston doesn't really have that. And for different sources like acoustics, you know, there's microphones like the Octavas, MK-102s, or even KM-184s or AKG-451s, which are small diaphragm condensers that will be great at capturing um, instruments that have very detailed um, attack and, and transients in general. Um, 
and you know if you like the sound of warmer things obviously ribbons are always going to be the option uh royer 121s or aea also makes very affordable versions of of most of royer microphones and rca microphones as well uh ribbons tend to make the top end quite silky um and then yeah going through a daw or in the case of universal audio using console which is the uh the control panel they have where you can add a lot of these different processes or plugins like uh, a bit of compression and eq definitely help prep the signal for streaming and you'll find a huge difference from just connecting the interface and selecting that as your video source uh, sorry as your audio source uh and versus going through a DAW where you're making a little bit more of a of an actual mix um, that then can be compressed or you know glued together a little bit on the output um, and then yeah I would say try not to hit the the stream too hard either because um, when it when it starts clipping you'll you'll find some nasty some nasty uh, sorry nasty artifacts that start happening on your stream um, so yeah, make sure to hit it, you know, at a level where I, I, I'm not going to talk really about uh, dBs or loops because um, it's going to look different on any software that you're using, but try to make it so that you're a few dB away from from the max, but also that you're not so quiet that you're going to have to uh, to make people really crank their systems. Remember that some people are going to be listening in good speakers and others are going to be listening on their phones or on their laptops. So it's important to have uh, a mix that's robust and that is able to uh, translate through different systems as well. So doing a sound check always helps quite a bit. You'll get a good idea of how people are going to listen to it on the other side. You're able to even uh, create a streams that go to an unlisted or private YouTube or Facebook link where you can actually watch the stream in post and then make notes, make notes and find uh, find ways to position the microphone into the best spot for what you're doing uh, with regards to the image as well. For example, this microphone could have been probably be better positioned if I had it right in front of my face, but then you wouldn't be able to see me. So just like in video and audio, you have to find the right balance uh, for for, for what you're trying to do and how you want it to look as well. Lighting is another very important uh, aspect that obviously I'm still learning um, on, but it's important to also look into it. And um, and then, yeah, rather than spending $2,000 on a microphone, for example, if that's the, the whole budget you have and you want to be able to mic different sources, then, uh, yeah, look into the Octavas or into the Aston line because for the same price of this microphone, I could have gotten the Aston Spirit, which I could be using on my vocal, and a couple of the Octavas that I could have on an acoustic guitar, and then have someone else play an acoustic guitar as well. Bayer Dynamic also makes great microphones. I just have a couple of those on the overheads that I got, and I'm loving them, and uh, they were like $900 for the pair, so... Um, so yeah, definitely look into that. Uh, check your face, obviously. This is uh, the how the signal is getting to the microphones at, at what time and what moment of the of the wave. So if one of them is getting when the face is at 90, let's say, and the other one is getting at 270, they're going to cancel. So um, most interfaces will have a face button. If you have two microphones on a source, always try to check by flipping the face. It will be pretty much immediately apparent uh, when things are in phase. You'll notice the low frequencies get a bit louder and it goes from sounding thin to, to sounding a bit fuller. Um, and then, yeah, have a great stream. Um, do sound checks, please. Do proper pre-production. And uh, don't get too stressed if you're not able to get the latest of everything. Uh, there are ways to make it work with what you have to a certain extent. Check also uh, OBS, which is a free piece of software that allows you to encode and select different inputs, uh, whether they are video or audio, or even how to add lower thirds or you know have a counter at the beginning of the show, uh, and even add some sound effects uh, to your audio sources. So I could be adding a limiter or a noise gate or different filters like EQ in, for example, uh, without necessarily going through a DAW. 
W. Obviously, this works only if I am uh, using one microphone. If you have a full a full band, it's is usually uh, the going through the through loopback or uh, voice meter the, the way that you're gonna have to do it. Um, but then, yeah, have fun, have a great stream, and see you on the other side. How to record a guitar amplifier. DJ. There are probably a million ways to mic a guitar amp. I'm going to show you the easiest, surefire way to get a good sound in mere seconds. My number one go-to microphone for a guitar amp is the Shure SM57. First, find the location of the speaker in the amplifier. Remember, it's not always in the center. There might be two speakers. There might be four speakers in an amp. If you're unsure, look at the speaker from the opening in the back of the amp. That'll show you where they're at. Place the SM57 touching the mesh on the front of the amp. That mesh is a perfect windsock. It also provides the perfect distance for the microphone away from the speaker, maybe a couple of inches. My advice, don't aim the microphone at the center cone of the speaker. Move it an inch or two away on the side of the speaker. That's it, simple, you can't go wrong. And there you go, that's how you record a guitar amp. If you like this video or have a suggestion for the next one, let me know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe. Today we set up for a classical piano recording. Be sure to make suggestions in the comments and like this video. Okay, let's get to it. Here are a few things you'll need. A pair of pencil style omnidirectional mics. I prefer the DPA 4006. A pair of large diaphragm mics. I will use the Neumann U87. Three microphone stands, one round bass and two higher long boom style. And you'll also need a stereo T-bar. With the two pencil style omnidirectional mics on the T-bar, place them on the stand about two feet away from the piano, aiming the microphones towards the center of the soundboard. Now take the large diaphragm microphones, select the omnidirectional pattern, and place them approximately 15 feet away from the piano, and approximately 10 feet apart from each other. Now at your mixing board or DAW, bring up the volume of each microphone to a suitable level. Pan the right microphones to the right speaker and the left microphones to the left speaker. Unlike a pop music performance, the panning of the microphones for a classical performance is generally from audience perspective and not from the player's perspective. Now mix the two pairs of microphones to taste. For a more ambient sound, use more of the far room microphones. There you have it, a simple four microphone technique for recording a classical piano performance. If you like this video or have suggestions, be sure to leave a comment and don't forget to subscribe to see more. Hi everybody. Well, it's January 2021 and the Toronto chapter of the AES is again having a virtual meeting, this time on microphones. Well, virtual meetings involve video, which is what you're looking at right now and what, which is what I'm making right now. It's interesting when you look at video technique on YouTube, it's incredible to me how many of these videographers talk about the importance of good audio. It's a revelation, really. We always thought the video guys were kind of off in their own world, leaving.
Hi, everybody. Well, it's January 2021, and the Toronto chapter of the AES is again having a virtual meeting, this time on microphones. Well, virtual meetings involve video, which is what you're looking at right now, and which is what I'm making right now. It's interesting when you look at video technique on YouTube, it's incredible to me how many of these videographers talk about the importance of good audio. It's a revelation, really. We always thought the video guys were kind of off in their own world, leaving us audio guys to run after them. But the fact of the matter is, videographers really talk about and uh, teach you can't make a good video, you can't have a good presentation without good audio. And right now, this audio is not very good. Here we go. Notice the difference? Well, I'm not just talking about what it sounds like. I'm talking about that, why it sounds better. I'm wearing a DPA 4060. This is a small, miniature, omnidirectional microphones, microphone, and omnidirectional mics have a lot of advantages. But wait, there's more. Here we are with exactly the same setup, with the difference being I've changed the microphone. This is a 4080, and it's a directional mic. So very similar to the 4060 in size, fit, and function, but directional. And if directional microphones have their own challenges, one of them is handling noise. This is uh, balanced off on this particular model with the clip that we're using, which is an isolating soft rubber clip. But you can hear the difference. You can hear that incrementally the amount of room goes down the actual vocal character stays pretty similar, which is exactly what it's supposed to do. There's more though. We've got another one for you. This time we're using another omnidirectional microphone. This is a DPA 6061 subminiature mic, only three millimeters in diameter. Can you see where it is? It's actually in a location that's classic. At the dawn of uh, live theater, when wireless microphones were being used in very large numbers, and of course they still are, the subject of miking an actor was a very big deal. Actors, they didn't want the actors to, to it, it, they didn't want to be able to see the microphones at all. And they did quite a bit of experimentation on location, where the microphone should actually be located. From the point of view of not being able to see it, from the point of view of not having to worry about costume changes. Um, and they came up with putting the microphone on the forehead, sometimes visible, or sometimes buried in the hairline. Can you see where this microphone is? It is right on my hairline. Now, this serves as a little bit of practical introduction to omni versus directional uh, lavalier mics on typical locations buttoned right up uh, on a speaker's or a talker's uh, shirt, and then this one up in my hairline. And that's exactly what our guest today from DPA, Bo Brink, is going to talk about. There are two videos. Uh, one of them speaks about, you know, just uh, speech intelligibility uh, and resonances. Very interesting. The other one uh, talks about microphone location resonances. They both tie into each other. Each uh, video is about three and a half minutes long, and I hope you find them interesting and educational. Thanks for asking us to be part of this Toronto AES meeting, and stay well. If you ever had problems understanding what's being said in a large reverberant room like a cathedral, or perhaps in a packed classroom with a loud background noise, then you know what it sounds like when the consonants are drowned. In this tutorial, I will explain why speech intelligibility goes down when the consonants drown. Speech consists of both vowel and consonant sounds. The vowels A, E, U are all generated by the vocal cords in our throat and filtered by the vocal cavities. The consonants are T, S, P, K, B, pretty much all the hard sounds. They are all created by air blockages and noise sounds, all formed in the passages of air through the throat and mouth.
particularly the tongue and lips. When the vowels are identical, the consonants before or after the vowel makes the differentiations of the words. The vowel or doesn't mean anything, but if I add the P, it becomes paw, or the L, it becomes law, and then it makes sense. Like the words top, bob, pop, they are identical without the consonants. So, the consonants are extremely important for speech intelligibility. Without the consonants, we are not able to understand what's being said or sung. Even though the consonants are hard sounding, they have very little energy compared to the vowels. It is impossible to add energy to the consonants. Try to yell the sound of a T. It's not louder, even though you are yelling it. This basically means that when you yell, the consonants are masked by the vowels. And you're not making it easier to understand what you just said. Consonants are predominantly found in the frequency range above 500 Hz, but most of them are in the area between 2 to 4 kHz. So this part of the frequency range is therefore one of the most important areas to preserve when focusing on speech intelligibility. Reflections, background noise or music can easily mask or bury the consonants. Listen to this word. Miss you can't really tell what is being said, but if I remove the reverb so you can hear it without the reflections, you will understand it. Missed. If the background sound or the reflections are too loud, it can often be solved just by moving the microphone closer to the mouth or by changing to a mic with a more directional characteristic. So the takeaway from this tutorial should be that in order to maintain the high speech intelligibility, you have to preserve the consonants. And in order to preserve the consonants, there are three easy steps. Choose microphones with a wide frequency range, place it close to the sound source, avoid as many reflections and as much background noise as possible. Why is it that we have to have eye contact when we are talking to someone? Does it really add to the speech intelligibility? Well, you can sense the mood and more of the meaning of the conversation if you have eye contact, but the acoustics of the voice is also a very important factor. The level of the speech is much higher in front of a person, but the intelligibility is also much higher. This is due to the content of the frequencies in front of the person talking as opposed to behind the person. In this diagram, we see the blue line representing the high frequencies and the red line representing the lows. The green line are the mids. High frequencies are only radiated in front of the person. And these high frequencies add to the speech intelligibility and without them, we compromise the meaning of the message. If we look at the vertical plane, we will also see a difference in the frequencies. There is a higher representation of the high mids in the 2 to 4 kHz area above the head. And this is very important to know that this is where all the consonants are. In the following, we will hear the differences between the positions on a female singer. We use a common reference at one meter as our normal. Because one meter is the normal distance for a conversation between two people. So compared to the reference one meter away, a placement on the forehead is close to identical. The forehead position sounds like this. I used to feel so uninspired. If we move the microphone backwards to the position just in front of the ear, we see that we then lose a lot of the high frequencies. It sounds like this. I used to feel so uninspired. Next position is the headset position. It's not as far behind the mouth as the ear position, so the high mids in the 2 to 3 kHz range are not as attenuated as before. I used to feel so uninspired. There's a bit more of the mid range where the consonants are predominant, so there are many good reasons to use the headset position, but it is still lagging a bit of the speech intelligibility compared to the forehead position. The next position is the typical lavalier position on the chest, which introduces a few challenges. 
One challenge is that the level of the direct sound of the voice is much lower than on the headset position, and we therefore pick up much more background noise. And frequency-wise, we lose not only the high frequencies, but much more in the mid-range, again compromising the speech intelligibility. I used to feel so uninspired. And again, hear all four positions without me interrupting in between. I used to feel so uninspired. 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 So, in order to preserve the natural sound of the voice when you are forced to place the microphone in a less than optimal position, like on the chest, you have to compensate with an EQ. You can use these basic graphs for inspiration to compensation. But this will only work for you if you are working with a microphone with a frequency response you already know. If you don't know the frequency response of the microphone you're working with and you follow these common rules, there is a huge risk that you're doing more damage than good for the sound. Microphones with a high degree of consistency might be a little more expensive, but it pays off tenfold in post-production. All right, on the line, Dan Cubbert. We got Dan. Dan in L.A., how are you? Good, good. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, you know, uh, happy 2021 version 2.1 of the world, I guess, in, in your neck of the woods. Congratulations. Yeah. Actually, uh, today it was 90 degrees outside, so it felt almost apocalyptic. Wow. You know, it yeah. is. Uh, do, you, do you have fires? Are you, are you in the, you're, you're in, uh, where are you right now? Uh, you're in I'm Burbank. in Hollywood. Okay. I'm in Hollywood, uh, uh, right at the base of the hill. I live here because I could go to Burbank easily, or I could go to Hollywood easily, or I could kind of get to the west. Well, Back in the day, when it was important to actually travel to the place to <laughs> work, uh, I was doing that. Well, you know, we're we're into we're into a new world, and uh, there's some there's some new techniques that are happening, but there's some old techniques that you know we we hope never go away. And uh, and, and 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 I thought of you specifically because uh, you are an expert in in cast recording. And right. uh, so this is a technique that is, uh, you know, it's rare. Like, there's not too many people who who, who do this thing. And 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 you've worked with. Uh, uh, you you want to? You, you, what's your? What, you give me the elevator pitch on 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 who you are and and and, and what you've been doing uh, for 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 all of those white hairs on your beard. What have what have you been up to, uh, uh, Daniel? For my whole life. Um, well, my name's Dan Cubbert. Uh, I, um, I've been in audio for a very long time, since 1985. Way back then, I was restoring old uh, wax cylinders and uh, wire recordings, et cetera, et cetera, a long time ago. Uh, but in 94, uh, I was fortunate enough to hook up with a company called Klasky Chupo that was doing Rugrats, uh, and the show called A Real Monsters, and my favorite, Duck Man. So uh, I was a friend of mine. He knew I was a, an engineer. Uh, a mixer said, hey, you want to come in and record dialogue and mix the show? Uh, and I've, I had recorded dialogue. I never mixed the show, but he showed me how to. Um, and so I was recording Rugrats and A Real Monsters and Duck Man. And... Uh, the Duckman experience probably led to all the other adult-based cartoons that I did after that point. You've done, uh, you've done Big Mouth. Uh, you were a Family Guy. Uh, you have done uh, some of some of the world's, you know, uh, most quotable, most quotable cartoons of all time. 
Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, pre Rick and Morty. <laughs> pre, pre, you know, pre Rick and Morty. You know, uh, yeah. you've uh, you you've done demo work for side projects that that spun off and 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 became other things. And 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 your 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 work was uh, hugely important in uh, in Hollywood cartoons. And uh, uh, well, I, I yeah, I, I guess uh, I was there for some very good moments. Uh, I was really fortunate. Uh, with my career path. So, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, I mean, you, it, it's an interesting way to live life. Uh, it was be prior to COVID. Now it's even more interesting, uh, because, uh, we have to record a certain way, but the cast recording, if I could, uh, talk a bit about that yeah so um, so so w- yeah what's the difference between so so most cartoons you know like uh tell me tell me the difference between a cast record and and just a like a single adr or a voice record session like what 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 makes the cast record different and 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 what what, what makes the uh, the experience different for people uh well a cast record um is the old-fashioned way things were done uh it's been modified throughout the history of, of uh, animation, but basically uh, I'll start with the Hanna-Barbera era because that's kind of when I came, uh, that's as, as far back as my history really goes. Uh, prior to that, they were doing things like, you know, sound effects on the stage and everything was live. It was a, essentially a radio show. Okay, uh, so the first time I had ever seen it done was with a, gentleman named Ed Collins, Fast Eddie, over at Hanna-Barbera. And he had a room that was pretty small, but he had, he had uh, let's see, uh, 12 chairs ringing in the room, and 12 Mike Sands, and 12 TLM-170s, and, and 12 uh, um, stools and, uh, and music stands with carpeting on them. And I started looking at them thinking, how the hell is he going to record all these people uh, without there just being huge room sound? How is this going to happen? And and he was frantically writing notes down on the script the second he got it. And I was wondering what he was going to do with that because uh, I was strictly an observer. And then they started recording. And uh, I forgot what show it was. Um, yeah, I can't remember. But uh, Eddie had it laid out. So... Um, he had one one person on mic one, one person on mic two, one person on mic three, et cetera, et cetera. He had marked up his script with each Those character and what he was going to do with what that. What mic they were on. And they started, and he started throwing faders. That's what they call it. Uh, throwing faders. Basically, when somebody talks, their fader is up. When the next person talks, their fader goes right up. And then the other person's fader goes up. Uh, but it's it's recorded at the at the natural speed that people talk so instead of what we do these days which is editing uh you know what we get from this actor and what we get from and what we get from that actor moving it around and trying to get natural sounding discussions these were actually naturally done uh and it it's a technique it's a skill it's hard to do uh and they called it single tracking which is when uh, the entire thing was done and there weren't any overlaps and it was a good take, uh, you, you would hand that off to the track reader and at one step of, of uh, getting it done because they didn't really have to edit very much, hardly at all. Um, so when you do a cast record, not only uh, do you get the opportunity to have everybody in the room at the same time, so you could get the full thing and you don't have to get pickups from every individual actor, um, the, the cast starts to get a vibe. And you can really start to tell uh, after maybe about one season uh, that the, everybody's really comfortable with their characters, uh, and and they're interacting like real people. It's hard to act when when uh, 
um, you don't have anybody else in the room to play yeah, off to, to feed off of. So, 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 so there's this this back and forth, you know, kind of vibe of uh, of, of yeah, like a, that only. In, but that's the same in music too, right? Like that's this, you know, it's the same thing in music too. Like the, you're a musician, uh, you're a composer, arranger. You're like there's that exact same vibe of of music where. Where it plays off of the thing, but uh, uh, yeah, with yeah. W- with the cast, you say like it, like it, it's not an immediate thing. Like like it's obvious that you know it, it, well, it, it takes breaking in. Are, like, how do they break it in? These people, I'm sorry. What what I, I, I say? How do they break it in? Like how do they break it in as a cast? Um, well, uh, first of all, let's say that most of these people, ninety percent of them, already know each other. It's a small business. The the animation voiceover community um so they already know a lot of them already know each other sometimes they bring in new people but uh after a while with working together people know each other's strong suits the the writers are are actually not having to hear things in separate blocks and wait for somebody to cut it all together they could see how people are interacting so they writers start writing more stuff for the more interesting uh uh relationships that develop and where you might have started out one way with the, the cast, uh, you you they start feeding uh, the writers material, and the whole thing develops from there. So it's a uh, it's a really good way to do things, but unfortunately, it is also a completely obsolete way at this point in time. Well, oh well, let's not talk about the 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 c word, you know, while we're talking about the other c word, which is cast record. Well, it's not just it's not just for that purpose. It's that people have gotten used to recording individually. Pre pre the c word, uh, yeah. they they got used to just coming in, doing their thing, and leaving. And because uh, it's hard to get twelve people together to record a show in four hours, it's just tough to do. Because everybody has has to make a living. You know, all these actors have to go do other things. Uh, but. Uh, you know the 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 method and that, the method now that we the one we were using on Family Guy and American Dad and and practically everything else I've done that w- was uh, recent uh, is we just cut it all together. One person comes in, they bang out their lines, we cut it together. You know, when, so, when I record uh, the big guy uh, for Family Guy, or at least when I did, um, he would just rip through the script. You know, top to bottom as one, you know, he had eight or nine different voices on that show and he did them in order. Uh, they he, we didn't have to do all Stewie and then all Brian. He just did it from top to bottom. And then he tore the script up and threw it on the floor and walked out. of her. But, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, there's some people who just are gifted that way, but it doesn't give you a chance to, you know, mix people up with each other and see how they react to each other. So, what are some of the, your experiences uh, with the cast recordings? Like, uh, you've you've done a couple shows. Like, uh, like uh, I see a couple of lists here. It's like, uh, when, when that happened, did, did does it? Um, like you say, there's that improvisational thing. Like, how much can a session, a recording session, change the cartoon or change the influence, or is that, uh, or is, or now because everything is all set in stone and you know parallel workflows, like, uh, does that improvisation kind of disappear because of this new technique? I would say uh, that. Until the actors get to hear a radio play, which is everything cut together, to see how things sound and how, you know, like on American Dad, uh, Steve never knew what, what his sister Haley sounded like until we cut together a radio play. And then after that, they started to, of course, they would do table reads. They always do table reads, but um, They had to find out how things were going to go. They didn't push it in a direction. They were just pulled along in the direction by the writers. Uh, And we've had some records that were just hilarious. Some cast records where we might have had four hours of odd because it was so freaking funny. uh, It went over, you know, like six hours or something. Because these people are hilarious. They, They are freaking hilarious. 
So, how do you so, uh, how do you control the hilarity? Like seriously, like when you get when you get such funny like like and they're all cartoon characters, like literally. Yeah. Yep. Like like how how do you how do you control these crowds? Like it's a different group of people compared to the music industry. Like, you know, what's 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 that hospitality like for for you as a recordist and for you as an engineer? Uh well, you start to get incorporated into the into the process uh, uh, at, only after a short while, two or three shows, and you're pretty incorporated into the process. Uh, and if you've been in the business a long time, you know a lot of the actors and actresses, and they may stop off by you and say, "Hey, man, I got a I got a, a three o'clock to record today. Is there any way you can get me out faster?" You know, and so you kind of get a vibe as to what's going on in the session. Uh, I say uh, a lot. The ebb, the uh, ebb and flow. <laughs> it's, you know, there's yeah, there's, it's no, my... there's no waves. D uh, or uh, but but I think there might be now after we have this COVID, there might be there there might be plugins that you know remove stutters and you know as much as they remove backgrounds, they'll filter out our. Uh, you know, I had somebody critique my, you know, train of thought because I say I'm a lot, but but it's also you know you're you're, you're processing and I'm, I, I process a lot in these in these things and and you know you're from from what I've known for you you've always been a a gear relative to the character of uh, of of like uh, of of the cartoon character. So one of the lessons you taught me that I've I've always you know wanted to dig deeper with you and this is awesome that we get to do this. Is, is how like a compressor and and how the microphone choice are, are so vital to the cartoon character and how it you know is 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 part of the character uh, the 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 attack and release times and and the 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 nuances of that are play such an important role to uh, the the continuity of that cartoon character uh, and and I've never understood that and and you know I would love for you to since, since this is an AES Toronto meeting about uh, technique um, mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about, you know, some of your session setups, uh, some of the things that, you know, you've ultimately distilled your knowledge down? You're like, like give, us a, give us a too long, didn't read uh, Hollywood version of, of, of what you've gotten into and, and, and some, of the, some of the techniques that you would re recommend for, for, for people who want to pursue this stuff. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, I wouldn't recommend anybody ever get into cast recording because... Uh, it, should it ever reemerge? Right, right. Because well, uh, no, but we have radio plays. I would stay away from that. And, you know, stay away from cast recording. But uh, from from okay, a cartoon about, character speaking of, point, yeah, from from a from a recorder's point of view, then from a recorder's point of view, um, well, it used to be that there were standards uh, of microphones and compression ratios and stuff around town, and uh, Hanna Barbera was. Uh, TLM 170s uh, at a one at a ten to one ratio, which was really really high, but that's how they did it. Uh, and Disney, uh, they were U87s. In fact, when Disney does uh, any recording, they make sure the studio, you know, any remote recording, the studio has to have a U87. Uh, animation dialogue is a gift to mixers. Uh, there's no planes. There's no uh, uh, people being way off mic. There's none of that. It's, it's fairly pristine except for uh, plosives and, and other uh, artifacts from speech. Um, but anyhow, pretty much everybody had their own standard. Uh, when Family Guy was getting started, um, I was pretty familiar with Seth's, Seth's, uh, Seth's voice after a while. Um, and I thought, well, I better get something that pushes the high mids that could cut through everything else that's going on, all the music, because uh, the music was very important in Family Guy. Uh, so I decided to go with TLM 193s, and I bought uh, eight of them. Uh, that's what we used for Family Guy in its first iteration, because, you know, we went off the air. Uh, then we came back, still had the same mics, only one went missing, so that was pretty incredible. Uh, and we used those 193s uh, for American Dad and for Family Guy, and they're still using them. Uh, the compressor that I like to use 
was uh, Apex 661, which is a VCA-based compressor. Super easy to use and rock solid. And uh, so I bought a few of those for, you know, I have one for the, for the main bus just in case, and I had a couple of others. Um, let's see. I guess matching mics uh, or matching sounds was important. Because, once again, it's a gift to the mixer, but you, you don't want to use a bunch of different mics on the same show. You kind of want to lean towards one sound so they don't have to uh, deal with uh, uh, different microphone sounds. Now, when you're recording a cast, you don't have to worry about that. But when you're getting different stuff from different studios or all over the place, you want to kind of try to keep mic characteristics sort of the same if you can. Uh, right now, uh, we're at the mercy of, of whatever the actor happens to have available in their closet to record with. But, uh, but as far as our, we've had to make all kinds of adjustments. But when we were doing the cast records, uh, the, the microphones were chosen and locked in for the, for the character that we were recording. Did that answer your question? Yeah, man. I ask super long and weird, you know, questions. And, and you, you've essentially summed up, a, like, I, I know you and I, we've, we've dealt back and forth with gear and audio gear. And you've tried every piece of gear on the planet. And, yeah. and you know, it's, it, 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 it comes down to, you know, it's, it, it's, it's cool to hear that, you know, the, the, the rules are, you know, like, let's be consistent. You know, you know, uh, yes. Like, let's let's strive for the same thing everywhere. Okay, like that's that's really reassuring to hear. I like, you know, that's like, you know, uh, but but it's budgets and 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 nowadays, like as as people are recording from home, are are you know, are is is L A sold out of Neumann U eighty sevens and T L M one seventy? No, T L M one o T L M one o threes. TLM 103s, that's the thing. Yeah, that's the that's the go to. Yeah, that's the. Yeah, if they're going to get a Neumann, they're going to get a 103, which is. It doesn't really work for what we're trying to do, but, but it's got the Neumann name on it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of the things that I've seriously been considering is, is uh, uh, zero coloration whatsoever. So I've been experimenting with that. Uh, I got the least, uh, the lowest noise preamp I could possibly find, you know, just straight wire with gain. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I've yeah. been, I've been experimenting with a few mics, uh, just to find what the most neutral sound would be. I have a feeling the most neutral sound would be a, a DPA 4011. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. but, and there's other, there's other cool things about it, but it isn't a large diaphragm, which is a big of a problem. Okay, but, but so, it, it has a, an incredible rejection. So, so uh, actually, it, its width is exactly what what it says it is. Let's put it that way. Okay. So, so okay. even if an uh, actor turns his head a, a little bit, uh, you're not going to get a lot of phasing. Uh, it's extremely low profile, so you don't have to worry about it getting in the way of, of your, your copy. Uh, but not very many people are using it. Uh, so, uh, my, my desire would be to, uh, if I were to be, if I were to set up and gear up for another, another studio would be these very, very low coloration devices. Yeah. Well, and now with HD, so, so, you know, we're shooting 4k, we're shooting 8k, we're shooting 12k, but here our microphone preamps are limited to 22k and there's all these beautiful nuanced frequencies that DPAs and those types of microphones can pick up and you know are are your deliverables changing now so so let's 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 switch gears in terms of like you know what you're delivering from a microphone like uh, you know are our 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 demands changing for new equipment like uh, and and and, and no. this no nothing at all no, no. Every, everybody. No, I mean, we all we want is great quality dialogue, uh, and I don't think there's been a whole lot invented uh, that's that's going to really improve on the quality of dialogue you hear in in uh, animation. 
you know, I'm, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say brand names. I guess I've already said some brand names. You know, the thing uh, is, they're, they're, they're tools. They're hammers. You know, like I like a Stanley hammer and, and, and uh, you know, I enjoy Earthworks, uh, you know, Omni. So, you know. Okay, well, I've got an Earthworks mic pre here. <laughs> okay. And, uh, yeah, shoot. Yeah, shoot. and typically I wouldn't have that because in this other rack I have uh, APIs and 1073s and then a bunch of stuff that I built. Because I, I build my own stuff too, and, and, then, uh, and then there's the Wardbeck stuff. So you know this then, is then the there's the Wardbeck stuff that that I am is a, a project in in the works. Uh, but anyhow, uh, I got this uh, microphone pre purposely because it has no sound whatsoever, and I've been using it with some mics that have a real signature, like a U forty seven or an eighty seven. Uh, and it's a completely different world. A, a 47 through this mic pre is a lot less intimidating than it through a 1073. So that's another one of the things you have to think about when you when you, get, you pick your microphones for your your cast is uh, you're not really going for the voice of God because these people aren't aren't doing narration. They're characters. The Simpsons use 416s. Well, at least they did. I don't know if they're still using them or not. But you're not necessarily looking for that voice of God sound. So if you were to be using a U47 through a 1073, uh, that would be overkill. And some, the person who had to mix it, you know, at the re-recording mixer end of stuff, would probably give you a call and say, what did you do to me? Why did you give me this microphone? I can't seem to thin it out. So... Is it is it too lush? Like is the, is there a lushness to yeah yeah, it's, and it's super super lush, super mid. Uh, uh, fuzz, you know, it's not actual fuzziness per se, but, yeah. but uh, when, once you start running it through a mic pre that doesn't add anything, you start to really hear the character of every mic you put up, and I'm beginning to think uh, that that AKG may have something going on. Uh, with a 414 that makes it real, and hate on me if you must, uh, uh, but, but I've used it. everything. And, yeah, and yeah. as far as, as yeah. flatness of response, the, the Transformalist 414 seems to do a great job. And what people are doing now, what mixers are doing now, is because they have so many mics types coming into them, because these actors all use different mics of different qualities, uh, they have to spend all this time matching microphones. And there's a lot of great software out there that does microphone emulation, but the important thing is you have to give it a neutral source, or as neutral as you can get, right? So maybe the best way to go now isn't the fanciest and, and uh, most lush thing, but maybe it's a 414 into a mic pre that doesn't add anything. And maybe it's just as flat as you could go. So the mixer on the other end could add whatever they want to. To it. I love it, Dan. You know, you, you know, for for, for, for you, you, you know, you grew up with a father who who was said Bell Labs, and and you know, you you're you're a hardcore nerd, and this is why we know each other <laughs> yes. so well. And uh, you know, so so I look at uh, the Neve stuff as well. That was the laboratory research microphone preamp of 1965, right? Like it was like if you went to a uh, you know research facility at the Royal Air Force in in England, like, and they needed to like turn a microphone up, it would be built like this microphone preamp you see in a in a Neve because that's what they had, right? And, and, mm -hmm. So, so you know, I look at uh, you know what you're what you're accomplishing. Well, actually, actually, I want to uh, I want to retract that. Okay, sure. Just uh, BBC sets a lot of the recording standards for what they record in in Britain. Not necessarily in a music studio, although back in the day they did too. I mean, the the BBC's influence on how you have to record. Uh, is is can't be overstated. It's, you know, it's they, they built their own desks. They they came up with their own acoustical solutions and they implemented it. And that's what you had to go by. So, and and uh, they and, and they were after laboratory grade, you know, microphone preamps for for everything. And they chose 
you know, you've got the uh, the 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 Canadian the Canadian Ward Beck and and the British the British Neve and uh, and the Canadian Neve and the British Ward Beck and um, uh, yeah, it's 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 a it's a constant battle for that and um, and and Earthworks is like that type of company where they make like like again to the like high precision microphone preamps and and high precision well, you know, measurement tools. I went looking at a lot of Brule and Care stuff. I don't know if you're familiar. They were what DPA became, I suppose. Uh, no, yeah. uh, no, their microphones became DPA. B and, the B and K microphones and Brule and Care, Danish company, um, they do test equipment. If they give you a microphone that says it records from uh, 80 hertz to 10K, that's exactly what it does. And they they did a couple of mic pre's, but they only work with their microphones. Uh, but that is like test test lab grade stuff uh, with insane levels of precision. Uh, and I actually heard one of their a recording of one of their test mics through one of their test regs. It was pretty astounding, pretty astounding. I don't think budgets could afford somebody, somebody with a budget can afford that. Well, but to your point, it's like I just need. 10 of the exact same thing and uh, or, or 15 of the exact same thing. So, right. well, you know, so so now that we get to the other C word of COVID and cast recording, uh, our, our, you know, Zoom and these types of things have sucked out that real time feeling out of a bunch of things. Uh, what? Well, well it's, it's sucked, what's going it's on? More, it's sucked out more than it sucked out more than that. Uh, we can expect actors to be a. Uh, uh, tech savvy mixers uh, it's just not going to happen uh they have their careers to to focus on and i don't think becoming the best recording engineer in the world is part of their careers but a lot of them have been driven into uh their closets because it's the only space in their their uh house that has any absorbency uh acoustically speaking and they've had to go out and buy like i said TLM 103s and Scarlet mic pre's, and and well, Scarlet interfaces. Uh, yeah, there was a big run on that stuff, but you still can't teach someone how to record correctly. You can't go over to everybody's house and set up their mics for them. You know, there's a few people who are high up on the, you know, high up on the Hollywood list enough that their home studios are actually quite. Uh, uh, sufficient, sufficient. No, fitted, no, overly sufficient, fitted. but, yeah. but they, don't, they don't, nobody wants you coming over these days. You know, I don't want them coming over here. They don't want me to go over there. Uh, so what it's become now is a lot, of, a lot of education for the director, for the, uh, producers on the show and for the actor that zoom quality audio isn't going to make it. We can't do it that way. We have to do something different. Uh, that your microphone can't be, uh, you know, a, a fifteen dollar microphone that you got uh, at Target. Uh, I love Target, uh, but we we have to have we have to boost everybody up to a certain level due to this COVID. Yeah. And then we have to find acceptable platforms uh, to to work on. Uh, you know, are we going to use Source Connect? Uh, are we going to use uh, audio movers? Uh, what are we going to, you know, it has to be easy. It has to be easy for the people who don't have the technical background to be able to get it up and running. And some of that is IT work and IT knowledge as well. So, yeah. so uh, VPNs and firewalls and securities yeah, and yeah. all that. Especially with, especially with Source Connect. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, you you it could take a long time, even if you're you're a very educated uh, IT person and an educated engineer, you know, audio engineer. It could take a while to get that working, you know, properly. And then you got to lock it down. Nobody can mess with it. If you're in a building that shares IT, you got to put a lock on that thing. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, you got to speak their language and put a lock on it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I have yeah. To agree. Uh, so, so we have the, you know, directors who are viewing things over Zoom. They might say that was the perfect take. That was the perfect take. And then you say no, it wasn't because it overloaded. 
And they say, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that on, on this. And you're like, yeah, I understand. But I'm recording it here for the purposes of mixing it. And uh, and it dis it distorted on this end. So the zoom audio is really in, is, isn't really a, a factor in any of this. Um, and you don't want to sound like, you know, a dick. Uh, but you don't have a whole lot of time to educate people. We don't. Yeah. We don't have. We don't have a special session of just educating people on what we could do technically, recording wise. People come in fifteen minutes early. Uh, you, you, or well, yeah. In this case, when I say come in, I mean they join your Zoom or whatever you happen to be using fifteen minutes before the session starts, but nothing is working, and you have to walk everybody through it how to get it working. Yeah, uh, and doing ADR. I, I haven't had to do a, a remote ADR session for a while, but I really admire people who do it daily because that must be pure hell. You know, ha sinking picture. It, it's just, it's a bit of a nightmare. Yeah, I could, I could imagine it would be, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's troublesome, but you know, Hey, well, people have been doing it and, and it may take twice as long and, and that's exactly it. And, and, and hurrah for employment and uh, hurrah for hands that accomplish tasks. And, yeah, uh, yes. and, and, and that's really, oh, it's, the, it's that's fantastic. Really, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, well, a, it's a fantastic uh, thing, but I'm trying to think, well, is there a way to do a cast record by everybody calling in, uh, all of them using the same type of codec, but having multi-stream, so you're able to record people sort of like a cast record, but the timing would be completely off. It would throw everybody off. Well, no matter well, how. Uh, yeah, in in TV, how we solve it is uh, everybody aggregates to one point, one mixer. Right. One mixer. So it's kind of instead, it, it, it you can't think of it as one Zoom session. You got to think of it as thirteen Zoom sessions, and then and, the and then mix, thirteen. Mix minus. 13 audio sessions as well, 13 source connect connections, because yes. you can't use the Zoom feed. Yes. Uh, yes. And uh, well, you got to do both. Then you don't have to you throw. Do you got to do both. You don't have to throw faders. Well, yeah, I, I actually, I always do that. I always have Zoom open for visual confirmation and also because people like to see each other. Uh, you know, people spend entire days without seeing anybody. So, so getting on a Zoom to do this, it, it may brighten up somebody's day. And, well, and, and also, I will say that uh, um, not the studios are not officially closed. If you follow certain regulations, certain rules and regulations uh, yeah. uh, regarding hygiene and, and sanitation, um, a limited number of people are allowed in to record. Finally, you know, all, all, there's mandatory sanitation and hygiene at recording studios who would have thought it would it's taken a long time mandatory hygiene at recording studios finally dad just yeah yeah i know <laughs> i know I mean, I mean but but the you know a lot of the 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 uh voiceover studios here with a reputation cleanliness was always it, oh it, yeah it's not like working at a you know yeah at, at, Another, Another music studio, studio that I was going to name that is purposely <laughs> crappy as, as possible <laughs> that has done thousands of, yeah. of, of go, you know, gold record hits. Uh, they pride themselves on being kind of scuzzy. But most of these uh, voiceover dialogue uh, recording houses are, are fairly clean. But now it's there are mandatory steps that you absolutely have to take. And uh, you have to consider that if a voice actor gets sick with COVID... Um, something might permanently happen. Besides, you know, the, the worst case scenario, something could also permanently happen to their voice. Uh, they, there are, could be permanent changes to their voice. So everybody is super concerned about getting it and that affecting their 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 entire career. Uh, you know, yeah, you know it could be a career killer. And it could kill a show so, too, as well. You know, like it's uh, yeah, yep. it's tricky. Well, Dan, you know, I could spend hours talking with you, and I have, and I, I look forward to maybe doing this again, and maybe we'll talk about like voice maintenance or something. I don't, I don't know, man. Um, yeah, but, yeah. Well, I mean, every day it's it's an, every day is a new experience, uh, which it sounds trite and, and contrived, but I mean, literally every day somebody's figuring out a way to do remotely what we used to be able to do together. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and maybe one of these days, I hope that soon, we could all get back in the same room at the same time and see each other. Everybody's going to be so happy. Yeah. Uh, because uh, it's a community, uh, it's a small community, and we like to see each other. Yeah. My it's friend, just how it is. It was good to see you. You be well. Thank you again. Good, good to see you too. And and uh, we'll talk soon. Yes. Cheers. Okay. Sir. Thank you for attending the Toronto Audio Engineering Society's presentation. Join us at torontoaes.org. Our sponsors are Solotech, Gear Audio, Sonotechnique, Bell Media, YSL Pro, Electrosonics Canada, BRTB, Global USS, Adamson, Lawo, and avshop.ca. This is how I record a grand piano. If you have any ideas for future episodes, let me know in the comments. Okay, let's get to it. The size of a grand piano can seem a bit overwhelming, but don't worry. Just because it's large doesn't mean it's hard to record. When recording a grand piano, I always choose a large diaphragm condenser microphone. Some good choices are the AKG 414, the Neumann U87, or the Audio-Technica 4050. But my all-time favorite is the Sony C48. To make placing the microphones easy, be sure to choose a pair of regular height microphone stands. One with a long boom and the other with a short boom. Generally, I choose a cardioid polar pattern, but you can also experiment with omnidirectional. If the performance you are recording is loud, you may also want to switch on the pad, which will attenuate the level of the microphone. Using the microphone stand with the long boom, place one of the microphones over the low strings towards the tail of the piano. Using the microphone stand with the short boom, place the other microphone over the high strings. I generally place the microphones about six to eight inches away from the strings. Now, at your console, bring up the level and set the appropriate gain. Pan the low string microphone to the left speaker and the high string microphone to the right speaker. There you have it, a simple microphone technique for recording a grand piano. If you like this video or have suggestions, be sure to leave a comment. And don't forget to subscribe to CBC Music Lab to see more. Thank you for attending the Toronto Audio Engineering Society's presentation. Join us at torontoaes.org. Our sponsors are Solotech, Gear Audio, Sonotechnique, Bell Media, YSL Pro, Electrosonics Canada, BRTB, Global USS, Adamson, Lawo, and avshop.ca. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the January 26th Toronto AES virtual meeting. Great to see you virtually. It'll be even better when we can see each other in person. My name is Dave Dysart. I'm the director of sales at YSL Pro. We are a Toronto-based pro audio distributor. My co-presenter is Nathan Jackson, who is a recording specialist at Long & McQuaid Pro. Together, we will run through some techniques, equipment requirements, and some tips and tricks for podcast creation with the focus on the audio side of things. We will present two videos. There are four methods of audio podcast creation, from simple to, of course, complex. One would be using a smartphone. Uh, you can use the device directly and use the built-in microphone, or you can have a device such as an iRig or any other smartphone-enabled device that will help you achieve the sound quality that you're desiring. Number two would be using a USB microphone from multiple companies, such as Blue, Audio-Technica, Shure, or any other company. Uh, and that would be plugged directly into a computer or a tablet. Three would be using a dedicated hardware podcast box from companies such as Zoom, Merits, and Rode. And number four would be using a microphone, headphones, audio interface, and computer, which as you can see, is what we will be using. Uh, so that's going to be our main focus, and our video here is showing you how we are making our own podcast with two people. Here. And we're going to focus on products distributed by YSL Pro. So this may seem obvious, however, we'll run through the signal path and what is required to get the signal from the microphone to the computer and ultimately the web. On our next video, we will create an audio podcast with two participants. We can certainly configure larger systems as required. So we will need the following as a minimum. Two microphones on boom arm stands with the participants sitting opposite each other for best sound rejection and visual contact. Or of course you can sit beside each other as well. And two meters apart. Yes, exactly. Uh, the mics will be cabled into the microphone inputs on the audio interface over here. The audio interface connects to the computer via Thunderbolt or USB 3. In this case we will use Thunderbolt. 
Um, headphones for each person. Um, although we have them here, but we're not actually using them at the moment. We could. If the audio interface has two headphone outputs, we're all set. Otherwise, we'll need an external headphone amp with a minimum of two sets of headphone outputs, and that's what we have plugged in right there. A computer running audio recording slash editing software. In this case, we're using a Mac-based system. Uh, we will need an internet connection to upload the finished product to a hosting site. Note that the podcast should be saved as a WAV or MP3 file. An example of a hosting site is a site called Buzzsprout. At this point, let's examine hardware options. We will start with the audio interface. We will look at a number of different options that Universal Audio releases. Uh, one of the main ones would be the Apollo Solo, and that's kind of their starting range of interfaces. It's a two-in, two-out unit, headphone and monitor outputs, Thunderbolt 3 or USB 3, so it's Mac and Windows compatible. Uh, these start at $679, and you can see one right here. Second option, and the next step up, would be the Apollo Twin X series. Two in, two out, Thunderbolt compatible, available in dual and quad DSP, and I should mention as well, the Solo, hence Solo, is a single DSP core. Um, again, Mac and Windows compatible, and they start at $1,099 for the duo. Next step up would be going into the Apollo X4, which we have right here, and that's actually what I use. 4-in, uh, 4-out, has two headphones jacks built in, quad DSP technology, Mac, Windows compatible. You can add an external headphone box as well, as with any of these units you can do. Uh, but with this one, of course, being the X4, you have four inputs into the system. Uh, right now we're using two, but if we were to add two other people or anyone that wanted to join in, we are able to connect right there. And then of course you have a larger session, you want to keep going and going and going, you can get into the Apollo X8P and some of their other units from there. Great. Now, let's discuss microphones. Some microphone basics. And it cracks me up that I'm telling the AES microphone basics. But, but you never know. You never, you never <laughs> know, and that's what I was asked to do. Okay, so for the purpose of a podcast, either a dynamic or a condenser mic will do the trick. Dynamic microphones are generally quite robust and do not require external powering. Condenser mics are more fragile, generally sound better, and require 48-volt phantom power, which is supplied by the audio interface or the mic preamp and is simply sent down the mic cable. Uh, some examples. Um, SE Electronics V7 Dynamic Mic. It's a really robust and good-sounding cardioid mic and a real bang for the buck at $139. SE 2300 Multi-Pattern Condenser, which is the slightly bigger brother of this 2200 that I'm using here. Um, the 2300 offers Omni, Cardioid, and Figure 8 pickup patterns. And to go into some more microphone basics, let's talk a little bit about microphone patterns. An Omni picks up 360 degrees. So if we had four of us around the table here, we could put one mic there, and it would pick all of us up. It wouldn't feed them to discrete tracks, of course. It would feed all to the same track. However, it does pick up 360 degrees. Cardioid, which is probably the most common microphone pickup pattern is a heart-shaped pickup where the <laughs> bottom <laughs> the bottom of the heart effectively if you're hand holding the mic would be facing your voice and it offers a degree of rejection from the back of the microphone um, sometimes what the microphone doesn't pick up is as important as what the microphone does in fact pick up uh, uh, cardioid mics are often used in live applications where you're singing directly into it and you want to reject as much as possible the sound coming from the stage wedges, which you don't want bleeding into the back of your microphone. Figure 8 pickup pattern has the two lobes. Where, uh, okay, here we are. The two lobes of the 8. If we're looking at this microphone here, this is the front. One of the eight lobes would be there, the other one would be there, and you have rejection from the sides. Um, handy if you've got two people sitting across the table from each other and you want to use one microphone to pick them both up and they're not talking simultaneously. Um, that's a great application for it. Also, in music applications, backup vocals are often recorded into a figure eight mic with people on either side. It gives you the gives the singers the advantage that they can see each other, which is obviously very handy. Um, of course, okay. if you're on a budget as well, that could be a great place to start your podcast. You want to have better quality, 
Dave and I could have used one mic in yeah. between us and do that. Mm -hmm. However, because of COVID, of course, two meters apart and two separate microphones. So some examples. Um, Austin Stealth. It's, that's the Stealth right there. That is. It offers four kind of unique voicings. Uh, it has a built-in shock mount. Oh, shock no, sorry. This is the Austin Stealth. Okay, sorry. That's the Stealth. Um, built-in shock mount, which is what this thing is here so that you're isolating the microphone as much as possible from any kind of floorborne vibration, that, that kind of thing. Um, Austin Spirit is a multi-pattern condenser microphone. Um, very useful accessory in the podcast world is a boom arm. This is a road boom arm here, broadcast style, and it's really, really good for podcasts. Um, this device here is called an SE reflection filter, and what that does is effectively fits around encompasses the mic, so to speak, and provides the mic with as much isolation as possible from room reflections and that kind of thing. Um, if you can't afford to have a vocal booth in your in your space, that a device like that is the next is the next best thing by far. As I think I mentioned earlier, microphones aren't particularly picky about what they pick up. They'll pick up what you want them to pick up, and in many cases, they will also pick up what you don't want them to pick up. So if you can isolate it as best as possible, you've got a cleaner recording. Um, this is a pop filter here, an Austin pop filter. Um, it gets rid of pops in excessive sibilance. Um, this is also a pop filter. Um, so this is probably not really necessary at the moment. Nonetheless, that's what that device is there. Hence, no pop filter for me, no jokes. Exactly. <laughs> um, Talk a bit about headphones. Uh, headphones are available as a kind of open back or closed back. That's a closed back headphone. What you want is you want to minimize the amount of sound bleeding out of the headphone, which once again will be picked up. I keep coming back to this point that microphones will pick up sometimes what you don't want them to pick up. So if you can isolate the amount of leakage coming out of your headphones, all the better. Some examples of headphones would be uh, Sennheiser HD 280 Pro. Uh, real industry standard, good isolation and comfort, and not overly expensive, $124.95. I own four sets of them in my studio. Um, Audio-Technic ATH M50X, high performance with good isolation, slightly more expensive at $219. Um, to look at headphone amplifiers just for a second, this is an ART 4-channel headphone amp, so it has stereo inputs that you would take uh, off of your uh, audio interface. And then it has four separate headphone outs, each with their own individual volume. If you need more than that, the Big Brother is a head amp six. That's six discrete headphone outputs, stereo inputs, and it's a rack-mounted device, so you can rack mount it in your studio. And you can also you could hang one of those off of here if you if you felt so inclined. Um, I'm going to mention audio restoration software and hardware briefly. If you have noise issues, a company, English company called Cedar makes the world's finest restoration software and hardware, including tools specifically designed for dialogue noise suppression. Incredible performance in it, uh, artificial intelligence built in, so it will actually change its, its filtering based upon the, the type of noise that it sees. And uh, It's very fast. Yeah, it, it does all that in less than 10 samples of latency, which means you don't have to go resyncing your audio in your picture after, after the fact. Which saves a lot of time. Yeah. What would you, Nathan? Of course, probably the most important part is how are we recording this whole thing? Uh, which brings us to our next thing, which would be our digital audio workstation, otherwise known as DAW. Um, of course, we have so many to choose from in our generation. Um, we're today using Avid Pro Tools. It's what I grew up using, it's what I like to use, and is an industry standard, of course, as well. A, a new, soon-to-be industry standard, of course, as well, would be Luna. Uh, it is a free software that comes with Apollo interfaces, and it is only meant for Mac. Um, Logic X would be another Mac-only uh, program, which is Apple-designed. And then, of course, you have Cubase, Ableton, Reaper, and so on and so on. Use whatever you're comfortable using. Um, if you don't have the ability and the funds to jump into a higher priced um, unit or higher priced DAW, you can start with GarageBand or any other format to get yourself started and then work your way up from there. That's great. So uh, we'll be back in a few minutes and we will be doing an actual uh, a podcast. Thanks for your time. Thank you. 
Thank you for attending the Toronto Audio Engineering Society's presentation. Join us at torontoaes.org. Our sponsors are Solotech, Gear Audio, Sonotechnique, Bell Media, YSL Pro, Electrosonics Canada, BRTB, Global USS, Adamson, Lawo, and avshop.ca. Hi everyone, Dave Dysart and Nathan Jackson back. So what we're going to do here is we're going to effectively create a podcast, if you will. Um, what we're going to do, um, our good friends at uh, Professional Sound Magazine recently re reviewed the Universal Audio Luna DAW software. So what we're going to do is I'm going to read part of the review, and Nathan is going to read part of the review, and we're going to make it a podcast. So here goes, let her rip. In spring 2020, Universal Audio released their own free DAW for anyone with their Thunderbolt interfaces, and it has since been making some waves in the audio community. There are many ways a software developer could approach making a creative environment. While most companies have chosen to fully embrace the digital realm and have abandoned the traditions of the past, UA took a different approach with Luna by mirroring the traditional tones and tools of music production with the speed and consistency of the digital world. UA has done a great job of creating an entirely new environment that instantly has a familiar feel. Whether this is your first DAW or you're transitioning from your favorite DAW, the quick keys have been adapted in a way that are intuitive and easy to learn while simultaneously falling in line with familiar standards. Luna offers audio warping functions very similar to Logic Pro X FlexTime or Elastic Audio and Pro Tools, allowing you to stretch audio without having to make cuts. UA went even further and created two unique high-quality algorithms, Luna Razor Blade and Luna, Luna Polyphonic, that allows you to stretch audio even further than previously possible without extreme digital artifacts. Kind of like that. If you're more of a traditional editor, the cut and fade approach functions work flawlessly. The mix workflow in Luna is also incredibly efficient. Instead of the traditional drop-down menu for plugins, Luna offers a docked, searchable window. The window searches plugins and presets within these plugins, placing the sound you want on that track instantly with a few keystrokes. Busing and routing have also been streamlined with audio auto naming propagating to associated buses from the master fader. Luna makes it easy to route audio exactly where you want it without having to spend time doing clerical work. Ideally, a DAW shouldn't have a sound. Unlike magnetic tape or vinyl, digital audio should sound identical to what it was being captured when reproduced. Audio companies have strived to make more transparent converters and to calculate their summing mixers at a much high bit rate that the process does not affect or color the sound in any way. Universal Audio, famous for its software emulations of classic hardware units, has decided to take a different approach with Luna. Built-in summing mixers with classic tone circuits are now woven directly into the fabric of the DAW. Currently available are summing options emulating legendary consoles from Neve and API. Once engaged on a bus, the summing mixer is activated on every channel running into that bus. It is important to note that this is not simply a filter, as the summing mixer integrates into the functionality of each channel. Universal Audio even went as far as to emulate the volume and pan curves of the faders, so the environment should feel more like an API or Neve console when you have it activated. In addition to console emulations, Luna offers an array of tape emulations that can be activated on every channel strip and can be calibrated to run hot or clean just like you would with a tape machine. All of these subtle emulations come together to create a very warm and familiar sounding environment. To use a visual analogy, where other DAWs give you the digital precision of Photoshop, Luna feels like a brush on canvas. So, there's our podcast. I want to say thanks to everybody at the AES, all of our members that are uh, watching this, and I wish everybody a lovely evening, and hopefully see you all soon. Stay safe. Stay safe. Here are five steps to making homemade reverb. Step one, find a suitable stairwell. The CBC has lots of giant stairwells like this one, but any enclosed stairwell will do. Step two, place a speaker at the bottom of the stairwell. Get it off the floor, maybe set it on a chair or a piano bench. Step three, place a microphone on a step. Lower steps will make for a shorter reverb time. Higher steps will make for a longer reverb time. 
Step 4. Send dry, unreverberant sound to the speaker via an aux end on your console or DAW. Step 5. Mix the microphone sound back in with the dry signal. Voila! A totally unique, one-of-a-kind reverb. If you like this video or have a suggestion for the next one, let me know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for attending the Toronto Audio Engineering Society's presentation. Join us at torontoaes.org. Our sponsors are Solotech, Gear Audio, Sono Technique, Bell Media, YSL Pro, Electrosonics Canada, BRTB, Global USS, Adamson, Lawo, and avshop.ca. How to record a jazz kick drum. For jazz drums, I try to get a more open and natural sound. Large diaphragm condenser mics like the AKG 414 or the Neumann U87 are good choices. In this case, I'll place the microphone further away from the sound source, again to capture a more natural sound. Try it a foot away. Be sure to experiment with the placement. You might like it closer, you might like it further. To get a natural sound that has a bit more attack, you can also try miking the beater side of the drum. Place the microphone over the drum, facing towards where the beater hits the skin, 8 to 10 inches away. You can even try mixing these two approaches together. But when mixing them, remember to check the phase of the two mics. And that's how you record a jazz kick drum. And if you like this video or have a suggestion for the next one, let me know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe. How to record a snare drum. The snare drum, the center of your rock and roll mix. My microphone choice, the Shure SM57. I like it close, almost touching the rim, one or two inches away at the most. Aimed across the drum, so it hears the entire drum. I never aim the microphone down. I'm not a fan of bottom snare microphone setups, but sometimes it can be useful. Try a pencil condenser. I really like the Neumann KM84. Mimic the placement of the top microphone, but give it a few inches more space. Also make sure they are directly above one another. Check the phase. Chances are you will need to reverse the phase of the bottom microphone. Mix the bottom snare mic in with the top snare mic to taste. And that's how you record a snare drum. If you like this video or have a suggestion for the next one, let me know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe. All right, folks, we are coming to an end here. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, participating in these presentations. Uh, these presentations cannot be made possible without uh, the help of the uh, Toronto Audio Engineering Society's uh, Executive Committee and our sponsors. Uh, Solotech, Gear Audio, Sonu Technique, Bell Media, YSL Pro, Electrosonics, BRTB, Global USS, Adamson, Lawo, avshop.ca, torontoaes.org, for meetings, events, Masters of Audio, member showcase. We are a safe organization. We are within our allied arts. We collate and disseminate scientific knowledge that furthers all fields of audio engineering. The AES aims to empower people of all ages through participation in a healthy, safe, open community presentation. Learn audio through events, presentations, met networking, and mentorship. Join AES.org forward slash join. There are executive members as a part of this organization. Ross Whitney, chair. Uh, Alan Clayton, uh, past chair. Carl Matchett, uh, recording secretary. And Jeff Bamford, our treasurer. If you would like to become an executive member, uh, please reach out to us on our Facebook, on our uh, regular page, on our, uh, we have multiple ways for, for you to reach out, uh, Instagram, all that jazz. Again, our sponsors and supporters are Ryerson University, uh, Professional Sound Magazine, and uh, Sheridan Screen Industries Research and Training Center. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you for coming.